society has been in chaos really since the beginning of time but today's society wow and social media makes it so much worse there are so many people who claim to be a christian but their speech and their actions and pretty much everything else they do literally say otherwise. There are people who are believers and non-believers who always scream, don't judge anybody. God is the only one who can judge me, right? Because they read one little passage in the Bible without searching for context or praying for an understanding, or they literally just don't even open their Bible at all. Or they open it sometimes, you know, maybe throw in a few scriptures on their videos here, and then they just don't do it on a consistent basis. They are literally not in their word on a consistent basis. And you know how I know that? By their fruit. Because you know what scripture says? You will know a tree by the fruit that it bears. There are people who do Christianity on their own terms, literally making a mockery of our faith and making our God look bad. And because of that, there are non-believers who don't want anything to do with God, Jesus, the cross, faith, anything at all because they're looking at us and our foolishness and how we're acting. <sighs> so recently there has been an uproar on social media. Social media has been in a frenzy for a couple of days now, specifically surrounding everything that I'm about to discuss because a beauty and lifestyle influencer who goes by the name of Sophiology decided to share that she recently got a Christian BBL. If you don't know what a BBL is, it stands for Brazilian butt lift. It is a cosmetic surgery where you go in and they transfer fat from one part of your body to another part of your body, I believe. Most of the time, it's either your butt, your hips, or your thighs. The Christians, <laughs> the Christians who are on social media lost their minds because Sophiology decided to call this procedure a Christian BBL. I saw Christians disowning this lady as if that's their place to do in the first place. I saw people condemning her to hell. I saw people being rude and nasty and mean and judgmental. I also, on the flip side, saw people encouraging her behavior. I saw a lot of girls and young women inspired to go get their own BBL. So on and so forth, girl, this is, as someone who has intentionally and consciously given myself to the Lord and gave my life to him years ago, and as someone who has literally laid down my life and my will and my desires and my wants and my dreams for my own life for his, as someone who literally every single day dies to my flesh because that's what we're called to do as Christians. I am appalled. I am grieved. I am so burdened. As someone who was created by God to be a solution in the earth for issues that surround this idea of artificial beauty and vanity and for women who don't know their worth and their value as daughters and who get their confidence and their self-worth and their validation from external things and temporary pleasures. I am so burdened. Oh my, you guys have, <laughs> y'all have no clue. I have been praying and cr literally crying out to the Lord about all of this since I first heard of it. Like the Lord wants me to bring correction and call us back into line because things have gotten out of hand and if ain't nobody else gonna do it, here I am, baby. This is not something that I want to do. This is not something that I normally do. Those who know me, those who have been following me for years, know that this ain't got nothing to do with my platform. But when the Lord calls me to do something, my first response is obedience. I don't really see anyone else outwardly and publicly doing this. 
I see all of the other public and outward foolishness going on. I don't see anyone discipling these women and young ladies outside of social media in this corrupt culture. I, although I cannot say everything I want and do everything I want to do in this video because I don't want it to be super duper long, I want you, Sophieology, and you, the viewer, whoever watches this video, I pray that every single person who is under the sound of my voice right now, every single person who clicks on this video to hear God's heart through mine. It takes someone who uh, has a spirit of humility and has gone through the process, the processing. So prayerfully, this can be used as kind of like a turning point to get us in the right direction. When it comes to really knowing who we are and knowing whose we are and knowing where our self-worth and our self-confidence and our, just our identity as daughters and knowing how beautiful we really are. Not any of the external things, any of the adornment, anything that we do to our face, anything that we do to our bodies and how the Lord has called us to live as Christians and as daughters. So we're going to do a brief study on this idea of beauty and God's original design for it because I'm seeing a lot of it's a sin to be beautiful and and wear makeup and get cosmetic surgery and like oh my god it has made me really upset for a very long time pretty much since i could comprehend this idea that society has taken this concept of beauty and twisted and perverted it to make us think that big butts and small waists and big hips and a coke body and super long lashes and big lips and long hair and light skin is what society deems as beautiful and the things that are most desirable. Well, we're gonna get into it. So we're gonna walk through this briefly together because I'm not excluded from this conversation and we're gonna bring some correction and we're gonna hold some people accountable because enough is enough. So let's get our Bibles. And I want y'all to literally see this in scripture, in the Bible. So don't just take my word for it. You get you a Bible, open your Bible and look at this stuff for yourself. That's what we should be doing anyway. Let's go to Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And I'm gonna be reading from the NIV first, and then I'm gonna read some different translations throughout this video. Verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Let's read the first part one more time. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Let's read a different translation. New King James says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let's read one more translation just so we could drive this point home. NLT says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Here's the point that I really want to drive home. We are literally created in the image and the likeness of God, right? So now let's look at this definition of beauty because this is all going to tie together and I need you to stay with me. In the Hebrew, beauty means glory, honor, abundance, God's weight, dignity, reputation. Another definition, which is my favorite in Hebrew, it literally means attribute of God. 
Okay, so now we have this kind of idea of what beauty is, right? It means attribute of God. What does attribute actually mean? The Hebrew definition of attribute, and just in case you don't know, I like to study things in the Bible by their Hebrew definition if it's in the Old Testament and by their Greek definition if it's in the New Testament. So that's where this is coming from. In Hebrew, the definition of attribute means to regard something as being caused by something or someone or a quality or feature regarded as a characteristic or an inherent part of someone or something. So we see in Genesis 1, if we go a little bit above verse 26, we see that when God is creating things, he's making creation, he's literally calling things good and it was good. God made something and it was good. When he gets to making us, creating us, what does he say? Verse 31 tells us, it says, God saw all that he made and it was very good. So we see God creates us in his own image and in his own likeness, right? And we know that the definition of image means a thing or an object or whatever to represent a thing or an object or whatever. So then we have image and we have likeness. Well, what does likeness mean? In the Hebrew, likeness means like as, similitude, or resemblance. So now we have this concrete idea, this concrete concept of how the Lord created us. He created us in his image and in his likeness, which means we are literally created in his image and in his likeness to represent him and to be like him, which means we literally have the same nature as God. So then, that automatically qualifies us as beautiful because this whole idea and concept of beauty is centered around God's goodness. So if we are called to look like him, be like him, have his nature, that automatically means we're beautiful. And the point that I need to drive home is that this concept of beauty, this definition of beauty is not centered around looks. Anything that the Lord creates, anything that he has created is automatically deemed beautiful. God himself is the definition of beauty, right? So then that brings us to this point where beauty is eternal. It has always been because God has always been. Psalms 90 and 2 says, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. What does that tell us? That tells us that beauty is eternal. This whole concept, this whole idea of beauty is eternal, which means it's everlasting, which means it was here before we were here. Revelation 22 and 13, let me pull it up. God says, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning in the end. So I need you to understand that this beauty thing, this concept of beauty, this idea of beauty is eternal. It is everlasting. It was here before us. It will be here till the end of time. So then why does society place such an emphasis on the beauty that you can see, the desirability. The Bible literally warns us of the other side of beauty. So then that brings me to this point, which is beauty has two sides. We obviously just learned that the inward beauty, the beauty that actually matters to God, and I have scripture to back that up too, but we're gonna get there. But then the Bible goes further and warns us of the other side of beauty. So then let's go to Proverbs 31 and 30. I'm gonna read from the New King James first, which says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. NLT says, Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. And then we have this example of Jesus. He is the ultimate example and the blueprint of how we as Christians are supposed to live and how we're supposed to speak and how we're supposed to look. Isaiah 53 and two says, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. If Jesus is the ultimate example 
of what beauty is and what this concept of beautiful is. Why does scripture literally tell us that he had no form or majesty and no beauty that we should desire him? One of the other definitions of beauty in the Hebrew means something good or something pleasant, right? And we're gonna go back to that, but I really want to get into this whole idea of where society started placing so much emphasis on the outward appearance. And we have here in scripture so many examples, and I'm gonna read a few. We have Rebecca, where in Genesis, I think it's 24, hold on, let me look. We see she's described in Genesis chapter 24 and 16 as good of appearance. Then we also have Bathsheba, right? In 2 Samuel 11 and two. And then we have Sarah in Genesis 12 and 11, who is said to be lovely and of good appearance. In Genesis 29 and 17, we have Rachel, who is described as lovely of form and lovely of appearance, right? And then we have Abigail, I think this is in 1 Samuel 25 and three, who is also described as lovely of form. And then we see even a masculine example of this where Joseph, I think, hold on, let me see, in Genesis 39 and six. So then we get to the book of Esther where Queen Vashti appears as beautiful, but also insubordinate. So then the king, and I'm gonna call him King X because I don't know how to pronounce it and I don't wanna jack it up right now. <laughs> he literally has a beauty contest, you guys, a beauty competition. Not speaking of the inward beauty, but the outward beauty, their appearance. Queen Vashti didn't live up to his standards, okay? Are you getting where I'm going? So he literally has a beauty contest to replace Queen Vashti because she didn't live up to his standards. He literally sent his servants to hunt Persia and scope out women who were desirable for him. So then he finds Esther, right? Who is also lovely in form and in features, which means she was beautiful in his sight. He literally chose Esther as his new queen because of what she looked like. So then we go a little bit further down in scripture and we have this, scripture in proverbs that tells us charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting so society placing so much emphasis on beauty and what women look like and their features and their form literally date back to the bible days this is nothing new under the sun there's nothing new under the sun but this specifically definitely ain't new so then what do we do instead right society has always and will always place more emphasis on what women physically look like more than their inward beauty. Let's go to 1 Peter 3 and 3 through 4. I'm gonna read it in two different translations. We're gonna start with the New King James. And this is where I wanna get deep into it. So I have to read the scripture and then go back and set up a backdrop for everything else that I'm about to say because I'm about to say it. 1 Peter 3 verses 3 through 4. In the, King, the New King James it says, do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. The NLT says, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. So a lot of people try to use the excuse that when the Bible was written, it was not written specifically to us. The writers of these books addressed a certain church or addressed a certain culture or a certain society. So then that makes us draw the question, how and why is the scripture even relevant to us? Because a lot of people, Christians included, will try to use questions like this and try to use excuses about you know scripture being out of context and it being addressed to a certain people to justify not applying it to their own life so let me set the backdrop for everything else that i'm about to say so we have these books first peter and second peter we're specifically reading out of first peter peter wrote this specific book this specific letter to christians who were living as strangers in a pagan society. They were living among uh, pagan people, right? Now, this is about to segue 
into addressing sophiology and all of the other Christians who have been. So we have these books that Peter wrote, right? If you go back and read and, you know, kind of study the context, he wanted the people who he was writing to, to know that there is a cost to choosing to live a godly life. When we accept Jesus and believe in him and accept him to be our Lord and Savior and King of our life, when we make the conscious decision to follow him and his ways, we are set apart and strictly dedicated to the Lord. A lot of y'all ain't gonna like what I'm about to say, from this point on, but we are literally called to live a lifestyle of holiness, y'all. If you call yourself a Christian, you must live a holy and set apart lifestyle. I have a lot of scripture to back it up. You can go study this stuff for yourself. Don't take my word for it, but I need y'all to know this. I want us to really get a really good grasp on what I'm about to say. So I just have to break it down in its most simplest terms. If God is holy, and he is, and if we are called to be image bearers, if we are created in the image and the likeness of God, that means we are called to be holy, which means that beauty is holiness, which means that our beauty as Christians is called to be sacred and set apart. That is the literal definition of holy. And here's the other thing, holiness requires separation from parts of culture. I wrote something down as I was studying this and I want to read it because this is really gonna help frame your mind. And the here's the thing, pleasing God, and, and hear me, hear me please. Pleasing God while also remaining relevant to the culture, it's a challenge, you guys. It's hard. And this is why so many of us are struggling with it, myself included. But when one is truly and fully satisfied in Christ, which is what we're called to, to be, this like, our satisfaction should be in Christ. We shouldn't need to participate in any of the sinful pleasures that are of this world. And when we do separate ourselves as unto holiness, we literally become a light in the darkness. And you can find that in Matthew 5 and 16. It says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. So holiness for us is evidence that satisfaction, the satisfaction that this life in this life brings does not require fleeting or empty pleasures. And here's the other thing holiness and being separate from the world and separate from worldly culture requires discipline in a self-denial. It requires discipline and a self-denial. Trust me, I'm going somewhere, so I need y'all to stay with me. <laughs> when you choose to honor the Lord rather than honor your desires to be a part of the worldly culture and the practices of society, you will almost always be persecuted for it. And this is what we don't talk about as believers living in this kind of society. But there's some encouragement here in scripture in Matthew 5 and 9. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness which means right standing with God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that brings us back to the backdrop that we've been setting in order to continue this conversation. So if you're asking like, what now? Like, what do we do? How do we do this? First Peter 3, 3 through 4 is how we do this, but we also have to put it in context and figure out how it is applicable to us and the society that we live in today. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. I'm gonna read two versions. The New King James says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against 
the soul. So let's go to the New Living Translation, which reads, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your soul. Now, when you read this verse in different translations, it'll say either I urge you as foreigners and exiles or I beseech you. They use some different words, but they all pretty much carry or have the same interpretation, which means, so when we're talking about I urge you or I beseech you, we're talking about to call to one side, to call for, to summon, to address, to speak to, to admonish, all of those definitions. But the word that I really want to use in this conversation is I beg. It literally says in the King James or the New King James Version, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims is what it says in the New King James. In the other version, it says, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. Why is Peter addressing these people, these people of God in this pagan society as foreigners and temporary residents and another version actually says aliens which means one who comes from a foreign country into somewhere else to live there another definition says one who lives in a place without the right of citizenship so here we have peter addressing these people as strangers as temporary residents as foreigners because they don't have the right to citizenship in the society or in the country or wherever they're living at so then that makes us ask okay so where are these strangers where are these foreigners where are these temporary residents from if we don't have the right of citizenship in this country that we're living in, if we're living here as aliens, where are we from? And so then we enter into this conversation about the kingdom. All throughout scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And listen, we can have a Bible study about this on its own because I love talking about the kingdom. If Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he has to have a kingdom. That's where we reside we reside in the kingdom of god we're not from here we're not from this world we are in the world we are not of it meaning we are literally foreigners passing through because we come from a different kingdom we live in a different kingdom dear friends i warn you as temporary residents of foreigners to keep away from worldly desires to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. The New King James says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Okay, so we figured out that he's talking to us kingdom folk in a pagan society. And if you do your own research and your own studies and everything like that, you can figure out what it means to live in a pagan society. But basically, a pagan society is countercultural to the kingdom of God. What society does that sound like? And that's the point I'm trying to make. We're living in a pagan society. There's a saying that we use in the church. It's not really a saying, it's the truth. The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. So whatever the world does, whatever culture does, whatever society does, we literally live the opposite. So that's how we can relate this text to our lives. Peter is talking to believers and citizens of the kingdom who live and who reside and who function in a pagan society, in a society that is literally direct opposite from the kingdom of which we're from. So it says to abstain from fleshly lusts. What does fleshly mean? And this is where we really get into the good stuff. So what does living fleshly mean? What does that look like? Well, in the Greek definition, it literally means having the nature of the flesh. Or if, you, if we really want to go there, it means to have an animalistic 
nature. And again, I cannot, I can't break this down um, as precise as I want to, but I mean, if y'all want Bible studies or whatever, then let me know in the comments if we could do that because girl, I be having some stuff, okay? Another definition of flesh means, and this is the one I really want us to hone in on, governed by human nature and not the spirit. He's telling us to stay away from fleshly lusts. What does lust mean? Well, in a different translation, it says worldly desires. What does worldly mean? I just explained it. So are y'all getting it? So what does the word lust mean in the Greek definition? Like what, what is he saying here when he says to abstain from fleshly lusts? Lust in the Greek definition means desires, cravings or longings. So this is Larissa's version. This is what I hear when I read the scripture. He's saying, I beg you people who are in the kingdom of God, who are from the kingdom of God, who are in the world, but not of the world, to restrain, to keep yourselves from desires, cravings, longings that are governed by the flesh, by your flesh, and not by the spirit or by your spirit, which wage war against the soul. What are your choices governed by? And this is the question that I have for sociology and everybody else who are making these kind of decisions to put their life at risk, to put their life in danger, to lay on a surgery table, undergo a knife, get cut up, all for the sake of looking better, what are your choices governed by? Are they governed by your flesh or are they governed by the spirit? There is nowhere in the Bible that says cosmetic surgery is a sin. There's nowhere in the Bible that says makeup is a sin or getting enhancements or Botox or whatever. Nowhere in here that says any of that is a sin. So we're just gonna go ahead and debunk that argument, that myth right now because that's a lot of what I'm seeing. Motives matter y'all motives matter and if your choices and your intentions and your motives are not in line with the spirit but they are governed by your flesh then something is wrong something is wrong and i can go as far to say that getting cosmetic surgery getting bbls getting cosmetic enhancements putting your life at risk to do that stuff I can almost guarantee you it's not governed by the spirit. And no, some of y'all are right. We can't say whether or not a person has a genuine relationship with the Lord based off of something that we see on social media. I said at the beginning of this video, scripture tells us that we know a tree by the fruit that it bears. We're only looking at your fruit, girl. That ain't got nothing to do with us judging you. We're just simply looking at your fruit. That's what we're called to do as Christians. That's something that we have to do as Christians. A lot of the choices we make when it comes to anything artificial beauty is rooted in vanity. But let's define the word vanity because I don't think I did that yet. All vanity means is temporary. It means a vapor. All of this stuff is temporary. It ain't nothing but a vapor. And a lot of our decisions surrounding what we do with our looks, surrounding getting cosmetic surgery or doing anything to our face is rooted in vanity. So let's continue. Let's finish on with the scripture and wrap this up. So it says, which wage war against your soul. Do you know what that means? You are the one provoking yourself to fight a war an unnecessary war that you wouldn't have to fight if your choices were not governed by your flesh against your mind, your will, and your emotions because that's what the soul is. Who in their right mind wants to wage a war, provoke a war against their mind, will, and emotions? Nobody that I know. I don't wanna fight fights that I don't gotta fight. So then the next verse, uh, verse 12 says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 
Another translation says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. So let's get into this whole, why are y'all being judgmental? Nobody can judge me, da 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 da. Let's, let's just go there since we're going there anyway. So this whole, nobody can judge me, but God, we're not supposed to judge. This stems from Matthew, I think it's seven verse one. Yes, Matthew seven one, judge not lest ye be judged. Let's look at that in another translation. And this is Jesus talking now. This is, this is what he's teaching the people. He says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Well, what's important when we look at scripture? Context. You cannot just pick out a random scripture and force it to fit into your need to pacify something. If you are going to use and abide by one scripture, you need to use and abide by all of it. This doesn't mean that anyone is expecting you to be perfect. No, there's nobody perfect. The only perfect person who ever walked this earth was Jesus. And guess what? He used all of this scripture. He is literally the word made manifest. He is scripture, but you cannot use the excuse of no one can judge me, but God, you can't do it. Just because you know there's grace and mercy for the sin or the actions that you've made or the actions that you've done, the sins that you've committed, the choices that you consciously make because you know grace and mercy is available. At some point, y'all, at some point, we have got to grow up and mature. That's what scripture calls us to do. How long are we gonna be babes in Christ? How long are we gonna drink milk? We have got to use this to hold us accountable. We have to. Yes, there's grace and mercy. Yes, the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sin. Yes, that's what he died on the cross for, but at some point, we have to start doing this the right way. And we have to start using this and these scriptures, everything that is written in here in the right context. We have got to start walking this Christian walk the right way, which is the way that God has called us to live. And if you are thinking right now that this and God are two separate things, you're wrong. God is his word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. This, if you want and desire a relationship with the Lord, you need to open this book on a consistent basis. There's no way, there's no way you can have a relationship with someone and not know their character, not know them closely, not know how they speak, how they think, how they do things, how they move. There's just no way. And this is how we grow our fruit. This is how we measure our fruit and other people can see that. We're not blind. So let's wrap this up. Let's go back to 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5. Now we know that he's talking to us believers, us who live in the kingdom, who are in the world, who live in this culture, in the society, but we're not from it, right? So now keeping that in mind, uh, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5 says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Let's read the NLT version, which says, do not be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. And another point that I want to make, they most likely did not have cosmetic surgery back in the day. And if they did, it will probably be in here. Back then, specifically this crowd that he's addressing, the they placed a lot of emphasis on their elaborate hairstyles and their fine jewelry and their clothes and how they adorned themselves. 
this, everything that we're doing now in this society is simply how we do that, right? So it says, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit which is so precious to God. <sighs> the thing that really stands out to me here is it says that your beauty should come from within, that unfading beauty. What did we establish earlier? Outward beauty, external beauty, the beauty that you can see with your eyes is a vapor. So here he's going back and he's using God's definition of beauty, which comes from within and is un fading. Outward beauty fades. It is but a vapor. Inward beauty that we already possess, we already have because we are created in the image and the likeness of God does not fade. It's unfading. It is so precious. It's so precious to God. And I really want to hammer this point home. So when it says God's sight, the NIV version says, which is of great worth in God's sight. Another translation reads, which is in the sight of God of great price. What do those terms mean? In the Greek, listen to this. This literally made me cry when I was studying it. Very costly, excellent, of surpassing value and extremely expensive. You guys, we have got to learn and know deep, deep, within our hearts that our beauty that is in the sight of God is so precious. It is so expensive. You have no idea. We have a glimpse of an idea because of this right here, but you have no idea the cost that Jesus paid to buy our worth in our value. And when we place that in something that is not rooted in what Jesus did and who he says we are and our worth and our value as his daughters, I'm not trying to cry, oh my God. We are literally nailing him to the cross all over again. It is a slap in the Lord's face for our confidence to be rooted in a false, external, corrupted view of what society deems beautiful. These procedures, these cosmetic procedures, Botox and all, all the things, everything that's artificial. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's wrong to go get your nails done, to go get your hair done, to make sure you look good, to wear makeup. Hello, I'm a beauty influencer. I've been doing this since 2015. This is a, a part of what I am assigned to do in the earth. This is literally a part of why God created me. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but there is something wrong in planting and rooting, letting this stuff take root in something that is but a vapor in that fit. We can't take this stuff to heaven with us. And yes, I know sophiology said something like that in one of her videos, everything she's saying and doing, she could take up with the Lord. Nobody knows her personal relationship, but her and the Lord that's between them two. And now I have to specifically address sophiology. First of all, I need you to know, and I'm gonna try really hard not to cry as I say this. Sis, I need you to know that you are made and created in the image and the likeness of God. I just said, I was gonna try really hard not to cry. You are so, you are so beautiful to him. You are fearfully and wonderfully made before God even formed you in your mother's womb he knew you and he created you for a purpose you were literally created to be a solution to something to some kind of problem in this earth the lord wants you to know and, and now i'm hearing from heaven the lord wants you to know that he is proud of you 
as his daughter. He still calls you daughter. You are his daughter. You are precious to him. You are extremely valuable. You are extremely of worth. Even if these Christians don't think you are, you are. He loves you so much more than you will ever fathom, than you will ever know he loves you so much. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you less, nothing. No decision, no mistake, no nothing. Nothing you can do to make him love you less. But I have to, I have to correct you and help you because that's, I, I'm not seeing these people help you. I'm seeing them tear you down and shame you and make fun of you. And anybody who is truly called to do this work Anybody who has a true burden when they see and hear things like this, they're not going to make fun of you and call you names and just be really mean and nasty and evil. Ooh, sorry, y'all. I had to go off camera and fix myself. And I felt the unction of the Holy Spirit to pray and to really intercede for you, Sophia. And I'm going to pray publicly and bless you publicly because all these Christians are slandering you publicly. Well, this was not on my to-do list this week, but if nobody else is going to do this in a loving, gracious, merciful, kind, Christian way, then the Lord has to raise somebody up to do it. So as your sister in Christ, I have got to to bring correction and hold you accountable for professing to be a Christian publicly on your large platform, but also in the same breath, publicly displaying a behavior that is literally direct opposite of the way we're called as Christians to live. The using God and Christianity as clickbait to run Christians like us away from your platform as if there's more than one way to be a Christian than to deny yourself and to take up your cross and follow Christ and his ways and his teachings and his sayings and literally renew your mind so that you can transform into the image and likeness of Christ. That is what we're called to do as believers. And I said this earlier, but if you're going to abide by scripture and use scripture in your videos, in your content, in your everyday life, and if you really want to live by scripture, you can't pick and choose which scriptures you're going to do that with. You have got to abide by everything. And if you don't know what that looks like, if you don't know how to do that, if you don't know where to start, please know that there are genuine Christian women, believers like me, such as myself, who are willing, they literally give their lives to this kind of work, who are willing to mentor you and disciple you and come alongside you and help you hold your hand when it comes to walking out this Christian thing, this faith walk, because it's not easy, y'all. This is not easy. Nothing about this is easy. Dying to your flesh and denying yourself and submitting your will and killing your wants and your desires to trade for his, to yield to his, don't nobody want to do that. But oh my God, it is so worth it. It is so worth it worth it. I would not trade my love and my devotion and my will to live for God for nothing in this world, nothing. And for you to get on the internet and do foolish things like this, when there are Christians literally dying in other countries for their faith, they are literally getting their tongues cut out of their mouth and their heads cut off because they want to, they don't have the luxury to pick this up and read it. They don't have the luxury to outwardly profess their love and their devotion to the Lord. It's not fair and it's not right and this has got to stop. What you're doing, what people 
who do things like this on the internet do is bring division to the body of Christ. And it's been going on for a long time now, but enough is enough. It's leading so many, and I, I'm, I'm sure you don't know this, but stuff like this leads so many other women astray and down a path that ain't got nothing to do with what they were created for. And I have a problem with that. I think any woman who is passionate and who really have a heart for stuff like this, especially if this is a part of their calling, of their, uh, of their assignment, this is gonna make us angry and I'm angry. This makes me mad. And I know a lot of y'all are gonna be like, who is she? Who are you to say stuff like this? Who are you to, to call her out and to correct her and to rebuke her? But please trust and believe. The Lord would not have me doing this if I wasn't qualified for it. It ain't got nothing to do with, with me qualifying myself. If I could give this up and not have to carry this burden, Please, the mockery, the song choices, and the videos that you're using to mock us in our faith, the justifying your behavior by saying, nobody is perfect, no one can judge me, all of these things that people who love to do what they want to do, who love to pass up on denying themselves, on dying to their flesh, of living by the spirit. All those things that y'all say, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. You set us on fire and now you're throwing gasoline on that fire. And we're not doing anything but trying to hold you accountable. Y'all, we have to stop saying that people are judging us when all we're doing is evaluating your fruit and looking at your fruit and trying to hold you accountable for like you do you understand what i'm saying and again y'all you go back and find all of this stuff in the word don't take my word for it you go find it yourself and again if if you want me to do more bible studies and to help you personally on a one-on-one -on -one basis on a group setting if y'all want me to come on here and do more bible studies so that i can journey with you because i i need help too we all need help none of us are perfect we are all walking this walk of faith some are more mature than others some are still babies in christ and that's okay but we are called to mature in this faith and go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. We are not called to be stagnant. We are not called to make decisions and choices based off of our own fleshly desires. At some point we have got to go deeper and explore this stuff and abide by it. There is a standard that we have to live by. It just is what it is. Y'all get to mock us Christians and you know like it's just not fair y'all don't do this with any other religion this is why people don't take us seriously and I have a problem with that because our priority as kingdom citizens as believers of Jesus Christ is to bring more souls in the kingdom and guess what they don't want to go anywhere near us they don't want anything to do with what we got going on because of People doing stuff like this. Yes, be thankful that God woke you up from your surgery. Give him all the praise and the honor and the glory. You should be thankful that he had his hand of protection on you while you were under the knife. But you do not get to label your cosmetic procedure as a Christian BBL. I guess because you're thankful that he woke you up off of that table. What about the people who didn't wake up after their cosmetic procedures? What about the Christians who didn't wake up? I'm sure Jackie all loved the Lord. I'm sure she had some sort of relationship with God. What do you say to her and her children and her family who had to go through that pain? What do you say to the people who didn't wake up after 
any other procedures, the Christians who didn't wake up. What about the Christian mom who didn't wake up after her C-section to deliver her baby? Is God not good to them? I'm sure they didn't label their procedures a Christian whatever. Like, come on, what do you say to that? This, like, oh my God, y'all have to stop. Y'all have to stop stuff like this. I genuinely don't think that, and, and some of them are, because I seen it with my own two eyes. But I genuinely don't believe that some of us Christians are condemning you because you got a BBL. Again, you take that up with your creator. That ain't got nothing to do with us. Those of us who are really trying to live for God and do his will for our lives could care less about any decision anybody makes about their own body. And here's another thing that I wanna say because I didn't touch on this during the, the lesson, but our bodies are literally the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have got to stop subjecting ourselves to the danger and the harm that is cosmetic surgery or otherwise out of selfish gain, out of selfish ambition, out of vanity, out of wanting to look like the standard of beauty or be the standard of beauty that society says is beautiful right now. Because guess what? Trends, standards, all of that, they change. BBLs were the, the, the real big thing a couple of years ago. Now, People are getting that stuff taken out of them. Why? Because it was either harmful to them and their body and their health, or they just caught up with the trends and realized that skinny is in now. I also think that us calling you out for your ungodly antics when you claim to be a Christian and be a believer hit a nerve that caused you to react in a way to step back and look at this and be like, hmm, how can I gain exposure from this? And that is carnal. That is fleshy. That ain't got nothing to do with being spirit led. And sure, you can say that more people are talking about God now that this debacle has happened, not in the way that you think they are. This has made a mockery of our God that we serve in our faith, which further perpetuates this, like people take us Christians as a joke. All of this, if you believe it or not, but those of us who really know and who have really been living this life and devoting ourselves to the Lord, dying to our flesh, committed to growing and excelling in the word and deepening our relationship with the Father. No, that all of this is flesh led. All of this is from the flesh. And it would do you good that after you hear this video to get on your face and to repent. And the literal definition of repent is to change or to change your mind or to go a different direction and ask God to forgive you. Not because you made the decision to go get a BBL, but because your actions have not been in line with the will of God. Those of us who are living on the fence, they have one foot in the world and one foot out. They struggle with living a lifestyle of being lukewarm. Do you know what the Bible says about lukewarm people? Go find it, go read it, go study it, and really focus in on nurturing a genuine relationship with the Father because that is literally all he wants from you. That's all he wants. I hope and pray that you heed to this correction. And if you want to talk openly, privately, whatever, please know that I am here and I'm sure that there are other women here for you as well. But at some point, those of us who are still babes in Christ by will, you're stagnant and immature by choice simply because you want to do Christianity on your own terms and you still want to live life the way you want to live it, not the way that God has called us to live it as Christ followers, we must 
take we have to take accountability for the way that we behave after we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, after we profess Christianity to be our faith. Because I guarantee that those of us who truly consistently makes Jesus Lord of our life and King of our heart, we are not acting like this. And again, I'm not saying that anybody is perfect. I'm not saying any of us are holier than thou because I know y'all like to say that too, but holiness is the standard. I want y'all to know that, but we can't do what we just simply do not know. And this is why discipleship is so important. It is so important. Getting in a good church is important. Having a solid godly community around you is important. Having godly friends is so important. Oh my God, I would not be where I am in my walk with the Lord right now had it not been for my godly friends. And woe to you Christians who are condemning this girl and judging her with a prideful heart and calling shame upon her. Shame off of you, Sophia. That is your right as a daughter and as someone who Jesus died for. And so I come against every word curse that was spoken over you in your life. Even the word curses, God, spoken by your children who carry your DNA. Oh my God. And I sever them now and I render them null and void and I break off every chain of shame, guilt, and condemnation. And Father, I thank you for your daughter. I thank you for creating her in your image and in your likeness. I thank you, Father, that she is an image bearer. I thank you because she is fearfully and wonderfully made. Father, I thank you that before you formed her in her mother's womb, you knew her and you created her for a purpose, for a destiny in the earth. You created her as a solution to a problem in the earth. And so I just speak life over her mind. I speak life over her emotions. I speak life over her body. I speak life over her spirit. And I call forth the spirit of peace. I call forth boldness to walk in the standard that you have called her to walk in and to live by. Father, I call forth courage to live out your will and your plans for her life. I ask, Lord, that you will overtake her with your love, that you will overtake her with your peace, overtake her with your joy, overtake her with your righteousness, Father, because your word declares that the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. I ask, Father, that you will overtake her with your grace and overtake her with your kindness, that it will cause her to turn to you for you for her help because her help comes from you. I ask, Lord, that you will uproot every shaky and unstable foundation in which she has rooted her confidence in and begin to plant her a new garden of confidence that is solely rooted in you. I thank you, Father, that you are giving her a fresh perspective. I thank you that you are giving her your perspective. I thank you, Father, that you are causing her to see herself in your eyes through your eyes, through your love, through your kindness, through your grace. And I thank you, God, that you are opening her eyes to see how loved she is as your daughter. I thank you, Father, that you are the God who gives us beauty for ashes and that all we have to do is come and lay them at your feet. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just want to say before I officially close out this video that it, because I keep seeing it and it's like, y'all, this happened, what, four days ago now? Please stop harassing and attacking this woman through your TikToks, through your comments, through your posts, through your memes. Leave it alone. How is this productive? It's not. It's not going to yield any fruit. Nothing is going to come of it. She's either not listening to y'all or it's making her feel worse. And for y'all to get on this internet and have a lack of discernment for someone who is clearly still a babe in Christ, for you to bully her and be mean and nasty and rude is ridiculous. It's crazy. None of this is spirit led. And if we are true daughters, of God, if we have a true and genuine relationship with the Lord, nothing warrants 
us to behave like this on a public platform. Nothing. We The only thing we should be doing is praying for her, not casting stones at her for a decision that she made. Okay, leave it alone. Go in peace. You either pray for this woman outwardly, publicly, or you pray for her privately. But all of this bullying and harassing and all of the mean and evil comments, stop. Because you ain't doing nothing but pacifying your flesh and you are also making our God look bad. I pray now that those of y'all who are being mean and rude to this woman in your TikToks and in your comments that the Holy Spirit will convict you and that you humble yourself enough to see your actions and see how ungodly they are. I have had enough. I've had enough. I've seen enough. And quite frankly, I've said enough. So I'm done. If you want to send me a message on Instagram or TikTok or email me, anything, whatever, all of those links will be in the description box. And I'll also link my Bible because I know some of y'all are going to ask, but enough is enough, y'all. We have to stop this. So go in peace and love. The Lord loves you, but y'all are acting crazy. And he is looking at us like, what in God's name? Please stop.